ahead and get started uh, with today's uh, brown bag. So first of all, let me, can everyone hear me? Good. Let me ask that first. Okay. Uh, first of all, let me uh, appreciate you all coming out this afternoon. Uh, I know everyone's uh, time is precious, and so um, we're going to respect that and, and keep things moving um, along this afternoon. Uh, my name is LaVon Esters. I'm the MAP director. Uh, MAP uh, stands for, the acronym is Mentoring at Purdue, and I believe in front of you there's some flyers that uh, the MAP team members uh, passed out to you. And so I welcome you this afternoon to our first seminar, our MAP seminar of the semester. And today's topic is uh, Strategies for Successfully Engaging 1890 Historically Black Land Grant Universities. Um, and again, so feel free to eat your lunch throughout the presentation this afternoon. Uh, as I said, I'm a, LeVon Esters, I'm an associate professor in the Department of Agricultural Youth Development and Ag Education. And I'm being assisted by uh, Brittany Brown, who will be leading us this afternoon. She's my PhD student, and she's the MAP HBCU Outreach Coordinator. Uh, then we have Dr. N Neil Knobloch. Where's Neil? Dr. Knobloch's over here. He's the MAP co-director. Uh, he's also associate professor in the Department of Youth Development and Ag Education. And then also on our panel today, we have Dr. Uh, Pamela Morris, head to my right, who's the director of the Office of Multicultural Programs in the College of Ag. And then last but not least, we have Dr. Willie Reed, who's the dean of the College of Veterinary Medicine. So myself and my colleagues will be on the panel, and we'll transition to that panel uh, soon after Brittany uh, Brown finishes her presentation. But again, my hope today is that uh, today's seminar in, uh, encourages a lot of dialogue and discussion on what uh, myself and my MAP team think is a very important element uh, in terms of collaboration and collaborating with universities. And so uh, what we hope is that uh, not only will you become enlightened, but also myself and my colleagues included find out more about what you're doing as it relates to 1890 institutions and how you collaborate with those institutions. And one last thing, and we'll get into a little bit later. For those of you who don't know, uh, as I said earlier, MAP, acronym stands for Mentoring at Purdue, and MAP is a USDA-funded program that we started last year. And the purpose of the program is to enhance the mentoring relationships of underrepresented minority and female students in the College of Ag Agriculture. However, um, our program is open to anyone across campus, and as a matter of fact, we do a what I think is a pretty good job of trying to saturate the campus to make sure that everyone's aware of what we're doing in terms of mentoring because uh, we think mentoring is a value component to graduate education, so we're just trying to do our part. Um, so that's a little bit about the MAP program. So without further ado, I'm going to turn over to Brittany Brown, and she's going to start us off, and then we'll transition to the panel. Um, first and foremost, can you all hear me? Not well. Not, no. Is that a little better? Okay, very good. Um, first and foremost, I want to say thank you to everyone who's come out this afternoon. Um, I'm going to talk with you briefly about successfully engaging uh, 1890 historically black land grant universities. Um, but first, I want to give you a little bit of background about myself um, so you understand why I'm so passionate about developing these types of relationships. Um, I am a graduate of the University of Arkansas at Pine Bluff. Uh, which is an 1890 land grant university. My master's is from Iowa State University. Um, and from there, I had the great, great opportunity of working with the United States Department of Agriculture for four years. Um, for two of those years, I led the USDA 1890 initiative, which allowed me the opportunity to work with 1890 presidents, 1890 deans, faculty members, students, um, and I had the time of my life changing lives of, of, of students, of, of rural communities, and it was then that I decided I did not want to work behind a desk anymore. I wanted to come and I wanted to work with people, and I needed the credentials to do that. So um, I decided to come here to Purdue to pursue a PhD in youth development in ag ed. Um, Dr. Esters is my advisor and I couldn't ask for a better mentor. Um, I couldn't ask for a better support team than the MAP team that we have here. So uh, I just want to give you a little bit of background about why this is extremely important to me. Um, so first of all, I'll talk about a few of the challenges that are facing institutions of higher education today. Uh, this list is not meant to be comprehensive, but just highlights a few of the challenges. One of which is the, uh, the decline of state funding for higher education. Uh, there was a report put out by the National Association of State Budget Directors that showed us states have cut their budgets more sharply on higher education 
than on Medicaid or even on prisons, which is a pretty scary statistic. Um, and also another challenge that we face is the lack of underrepresented minorities, or URMs, in STEM. In fact, a report done um, that was uh, sponsored by the AGAP program shows that URMs only account for 7.9% of science and engineering doctorate held academic positions on campuses. And another challenge that is more specific to the 1862s of the world, to the Purdue's of the world, uh, is um, how do we remain our relevance, uh, maintain our relevance in the 21st century? So to help us meet some of these challenges, I'm sure that there are a variety of ways to do this. But um, in, my, in my experience in working with 1890s and collaborating with some of the MAP team and other professionals that I've worked with, we believe that partnership can help us to meet some of these challenges. In fact, uh, there was a book published by the National Academies, which our own Dr. Esters had the opportunity to work with that said that multi-institution partnerships can help to create high quality partnerships and opportunities that are far greater than, than any institution can create on their own. And there have also been other reports that say that state um, and higher education officials should work together to provide access to low income and at risk students. So that brings us to what we're gonna to discuss today. Um, again, this is not a list that is comprehensive, and as scientists, it might be hard to believe that this is not a scientific, scientifically tested list of, of best practices for partnering, but um, in working with my Purdue MAP team and working with former colleagues who work at 1890s, who work at 1862s, we've collaborated to put this list of steps together on how to successfully engage 1890 land grant universities. So our first step is recognizing the value of the 1862-1890 land grant relationship. Um, I'm sure most of you all know the history, but just in case, I'll give you a, a brief description. Um, in 1862, the first Morrill Act was passed to establish land-grant universities in every state to teach agriculture and mechanical arts. But since that was passed during the Civil War, African Americans in southern states did not benefit from this act. And so, in 1890, a second Morrill Act was passed to establish land-grant universities in southern states. 17 states to be exact, to teach agriculture and the mechanical arts to African Americans. Um, I don't have here information about the Hatch Act, and I don't have information about the Smith-Lever Act, but it is important to know um, that those two acts were established and gave funding for um, establishing cooperative extension and for establishing agricultural research experiment stations, but unfortunately, um, 1890s were not um, privileged to have that funding and so not until 1977 with the Evans-Allen Act did 1890s receive federal funding to conduct agricultural research and then not until 1997 did 1890s receive funding um, for agricultural extension activities. Before those acts were passed, um, 1890 funding was funneled through 1862 universities through a memorandum of understanding. So it is important to know that there is a very interesting relationship, a very interesting history between 1862 and 1890 land grant universities because we were created to serve the same types of working class people and we were created with the mission of research, teaching, and extension, but unfortunately have not been funded equally to carry out those responsibilities. Uh, the second step is knowing your partners. So who are these 1890 universities? Well, as I said before, they're located in 17 states and they're classified as historically black colleges and universities. The average enrollments of 1890 universities are about 5,600 students and 1890s typically serve low-income students. About 66% of the students receive Pell Grants compared to a national average of 46% and 71% of students at 1890s receive federal loans compared to the national average of 54%. Uh, we enroll about 62% of all students and 52% of African American students enrolled in land-grant universities. 
Um, that, that might not seem like a very shocking statistic to you, but there are 109 land-grant universities. So the fact that these 18 universities enroll 52% of all Africans of African Americans is kind of a big deal. Um, and last but certainly not least, 1890s award more than 20% of bachelor or excuse me of bachelor's degrees in the STEM fields. Uh, to give you an, oppor an, an opportunity to see where some of these are, uh, this is a map that was produced by uh, the National Institute of Food and Agriculture and points out each of the 1890 land-grant universities. Um, some cool facts about some of these universities, you'll see that Florida A&M is located right here on the bottom. It is the largest 1890, and they enroll about 12,000 students. Um, also over here is North Carolina A&T State University, and they produce the largest number of bachelors, masters, and PhDs to African Americans in engineering. So the third step in engaging successfully with 1890s is to seek meaningful and mutually beneficial partnerships. Well, what does that mean? That means to seek partnerships that are complementary to your efforts. Um, it's not enough to send an email to a listserv of, of HBCUs or 1890s to say, hey, we need a partner. Um, it's important that you seek seek those partnerships that are going to help you meet your mutually beneficial goals. And I've listed here um, just a very short list of resources that you can use. Um, at each of the 1890 land-grant universities, there's a center of excellence where research is conducted on a specific area. Uh, for example, at the University of Arkansas at Pine Bluff, we have a center of excellence in aquaculture. Um, another resource is the Association of Research Directors. Um, it is headquartered at the University of Maryland at Eastern Shore, um, but it's each of the 1890 land-grant um, universities is represented in that group. And um, each of the research directors um, can give you a brief overview of the types of research activities that are going on at those universities. Um, another resource is the Association of Extension Administrators, um, also represented by all 1890 land-grant universities. And you'll find the Extension Administrators of each of these universities are extremely well-versed in all of the Extension programmatic and research activities going on at these campuses. Um, another point is to invest time in finding the right fit. Uh, when I came here to Purdue, Dr. Esters talked to me a lot about finding the right fit. And that is extremely important in seeking to find um, an 1890, any partner, um, and definitely an 1890 research partner. So I encourage you to look beyond the website. Um, oftentimes you may go to an 1890 university's website and you find that it is not as robust as what we see here at Purdue. And so I encourage you, sch schedule telephone calls, schedule Skype conversations so that you can have good conversation about your potential partnerships. Um, and I also encourage encourage you to consult with colleagues who have established great 1890 relationships and you'll get to talk with some of those people this afternoon. Um, and another point um, on this slide is to build mutually beneficial partnerships. So what does that mean? Um, for a really, really long time, because of the 1890-1862 history, 1890s um, sometimes feel like they're not sitting at the big kids' table and they feel like their, that their input is not as valued. And so it is important that everyone is an equal player in these relationships. And so you ask yourself not only what's in it for Purdue, but also what's in it for this 1890 partner. One of the four steps is to communicate efficiently and effectively. Um, first and foremost, you want to be very, very clear um, of your expectations in terms of your project and programmatic goals, the time commitment from both Purdue and the 1890 partner, uh, the deliverables that are expected, the contributions from each portion of the team. Um, oftentimes at Purdue, especially as a former professional, I really like to use email a lot. And so it's hard for us to pick up the telephone sometimes, but you know, that's, that's a good old fashioned way. Sometimes you just need to pick up the telephone and get a warm body on the other side so that you can start to build those relationships and build rapport um, with some of the folks at the 1890 universities. Um, and it's also a great tool um, if you use those technological tools that are available today. I just recently worked on a project with Dr. Esther's and Knobloch and 
we used Google Docs, which was great because it allows you to work on um, work on documents simultaneously. I mean, you don't have to be in the same place at the same time. So use your technological tools to your advantage, especially um, for Purdue, who does not have an 1890 land grant in its state. So it's hard to get together. Um, so definitely use those technological tools to your advantage. Um, and last but certainly not least, um, the fifth step is understanding the dynamic nature of 1890 universities. Um, I, my first bullet here is the demand of faculty time, and I'm sure all of you are thinking everybody's really, really busy. But the difference is, um, when you walk onto a campus like Purdue, you don't see students like me who are research assistants or teaching assistants. Um, oftentimes, 1890s don't have the capacity for that type of assistance. And so you find that not only are faculty members doing research, not only are they teaching courses, but they're grading papers. And when they see an increase in enrollment, which is really great for the university, that means that some of those professors are pulled to teach more classes but they have less assistance from people like me who are graduate assistants. Um, you also have to understand that the institutional infrastructure is very different. Um, 1890s are oftentimes organized very differently than 1890 universities and so I encourage you not to give up if you think that you call and you say well at Purdue the person who takes care of, of agricultural research is located in this office. I called this office at an 1890 and that person's not there. I encourage you to do a little bit more digging because oftentimes we're structured differently because of, the, because of our needs. And so I encourage you to dig a little bit deeper and, and uh, continue to, to search out and seek and find the people that you are hoping to partner with. Um, and also there's a different emphasis on research and teaching. Um, when I was at an 1890 university, um, I didn't know a whole lot about research, to be completely honest, because oftentimes the faculty members are pulled to teach students and um, to remediate quite a bit of students. But here, students, even at the undergraduate level, are exposed to research opportunities. And so it's important to understand that dynamic um, as you begin to work with 1890 partners. Um, also, another point is there's a lack of financial resources. Again, that's something that every land grant, that every public university is facing. Um, but oftentimes, what we lose here at Purdue, um, it may, it's, it may seem like a drop in the bucket here, but it really, really affects um, the implementation and the execution of programs at 1890s. And so it's important to understand that when, when budget cuts happen here, they happen at a, at a greater volume at an 1890 university. And last but certainly not least, um, as I alluded to before, 1890 universities typically serve low-income students. And with low-income students, there, there comes a unique set of needs that oftentimes faculty are called on to help, um, to help students with. Or you just, you sometimes just don't have the students who are, who are there and focusing on research because they often have part-time jobs or they often have um, very different family dynamics that call on them um, to be readily available uh, to, to help their families when they need to and that may mean that they can't they, can, they won't be in class they can't come and, and, and help Dr. Estes with a project if he needs some help really really quickly and unfortunately um, they don't have that at all 1890s and so I know you're probably thinking with them right what's in it for me what's in it for Purdue um, well, we think this is extremely important because it gives us an opportunity to build a pipeline of underrepresented minorities from 1890s to pursue post-secondary STEM degrees um, like I'm doing today or like a few of the people that I see in the audience today who came from 1890 Land Grant University. So it gives us an opportunity to not only develop um, pipelines but to strengthen those that may possibly already be there. <laughs> Um, it also gives us an opportunity to tap into the expertise and the knowledge available at 1890s. Um, as I said before, 1890s are typically very small, but they have some of the best and brightest students and professors around. And so it's important that we tap into that knowledge as well. Um, and with that knowledge, it gives us an opportunity to uh, call share on research initiatives and the coupling of that knowledge definitely makes grant proposals more competitive. So that's definitely mutually beneficial to all of us. Um, and last but not least, my point here, um, maintaining relevance as a land-grant university in the 21st century. 
Um, way, way, way back when in 1862, uh, land-grant universities were established to provide access to education to all people, to working class people, and it is through these partnerships that the Purdue's of the world um, will continue on uh, to, be, to, be, to live out the legacy of land-grant universities and why we were created. Um, so, so to close out, I'll just give a few examples of successful partnerships. Um, all the way on the left side of the slide, you'll see that in 1982, Florida A&M University and Florida State University um, combined their colleges of engineering and have been very successful in doing that for quite some time. Uh, the middle picture you'll see there is from the University of Arkansas. Recently, um, my alma mater, the University of Arkansas at Pine Bluff, partnered with the University of Arkansas at Fayetteville, uh, which is a primary campus, on a three plus one program. It allows graduating seniors from UAPB to take courses at the University of Arkansas. And in addition to their animal science bachelor's degree, they will also receive a certi certificate of excellence in poultry. Um, and then also a little bit different from what we experience here in Indiana because we don't have an 1890 land grant. Um, in states where they have an 1890 and an 1862, their cooperative extension service works collaboratively to ensure that all communities, to ensure that um, all students, families, teachers, that all stakeholders um, are, are helped there. Um, and last but certainly not least, Dr. Esther's talked a little bit about the MAP program, but um, MAP, again, is mentoring at Purdue, and uh, we work collaboratively uh, with three 1890 universities currently, um, with Florida A&M University, with Langston University, and with North Carolina A&T State University, and the goal is to increase the number of women and underrepresented minorities in agriculture. Um, so these are just a few examples, and so now, um, this is a great segue, if we could have our panelists um, come to the front here, and we'll let them tell you about some of the successful partnerships that they've engaged in. Dr. Esther has introduced each of our panelists um, before we started the program, but um, what I would like to do is just ask that each of them uh, introduce themselves briefly and share a little bit about uh, successful uh, collaborations and partnerships that they've had with 1890 Land Grant Universities. Um, and if we, uh, if you don't mind, Dr. Reed, Dean Reed, if you, if you could start. And I'll put your slide up also to talk about your, uh, your MOU with Tuskegee University. Well, first of all, good afternoon, everyone, and um, I'm pleased to have the opportunity to come and, and uh, participate in this uh, session, uh, this noon hour. Um, so I have been uh, Dean of the College of Veterinary Medicine for seven years, and prior to that, I, I worked uh, for Michigan State University as a department head and director of their veterinary diagnostic lab, and prior to that, I was actually here on the faculty at, at Purdue. And prior to my faculty appointment at Purdue, I was in veterinary school at uh, Tuskegee University in, in Tuskegee, Alabama. So I am a product of a historically black institution. I have two degrees from Tuskegee. I have a bachelor's of science degree in animal and poultry science. And, uh, and then, of course, my, my DVM degree. Um, so the partnerships that I have with, uh, with, with Tuskegee actually go back uh, long before I, I came back to, to Purdue. Uh, when I was a department head at Michigan State, uh, head of the pathobiology department and director of the diagnostic lab, we established um, a, a summer program uh, for, for veterinary students. And these students came to our uh, institution, our department, and uh, worked with the faculty. And most of them had a strong interest in, in, in pathology. Uh, and I, um, I think it was one of the most successful programs that I have had because these, uh, as these students came to, came to uh, Michigan State, they worked with our faculty, they established um, relationships and so much is based on relationships 
Well, in order for me to get the students to actually even come to Michigan State, I had to uh, establish uh, a strong relationship with the uh, pathology department in the veterinary school there. So I had colleagues that I knew that I got to know, and and when I uh, would uh, seek students, uh, they would find students for me, and I knew they were great students. Uh, and these were people that understood uh, the kind of people that we were looking for. Uh, we wanted people that were serious about pursuing uh, careers in pathology. And as these st students came up in the summer, they had a wonderful time with our faculty. And then later on, when they um, finished veterinary school and applied for pathology residency programs or PhD programs, our faculty already knew them. They already felt good about the place. And so we actually, when I left there seven years ago, we had developed the largest largest pathology training program in North America and I was very proud of the fact that uh, uh, almost half of the PhD students that we had in this program were underrepresented students. Many of them were from uh, Tuskegee, uh, some were from other uh, schools where we had relationships but not as strong relationships and these are with uh, a majority uh, institutions since there's only one um, university, historically black university, that houses a veterinary school, and that's uh, that's Tuskegee. And so, when I came to uh, to Purdue seven years ago, we um, established an MOU mem uh, memorandum of understanding with Tuskegee, and it's a little bit different uh, in that this mem memorandum uh, allows for the exchange of um, DVM students. Uh, students are able in their uh, fourth year to come to Purdue to do clinical rotations. Uh, then we also have the ability to um, accept students into our internship programs, uh, residency programs, PhD programs. And that, uh, that program is um, uh, it's not moving as fast as I had hoped it would move. Uh, we've had some success. Uh, but we're finding you know, things have changed a lot, and um, um, the students have, I think, many more opportunities now than they did even 10 years ago. Um, majority institutions like, like Purdue, uh, many of them are reaching uh, uh, back and wanting to collaborate with uh, historically black colleges, universities. And so I think they sense that there's a lot of, um, there's a lot of competition, uh, so to speak. Uh, and they wonder, you know, why all these institutions are knocking at our, our doors? Uh, why, you know, what are their motives? Uh, are they really interested in our students? Are they really interested in us as true uh, collaborators? So I think all of this is, is changing the, the landscape. And so what I have taken away from this is that going back to what I said early on, relationships, it is all built on relationships and what I have found is that I have to be as a dean directly involved hands-on I have to help create those relationships while the faculty do a great job in this sometimes I have to get involved to help open the door uh, so that when those calls are made that that they are returned that you can talk to people and and then also I have to go to sometimes to conferences and meetings that I normally would not attend just to interact with uh, people um, at certain levels so that I can get to know them, so that I can establish relationships, friendships uh, that will lead to uh, uh, collaboration. So it, it all gets back to relationships and building, I think, trust because when majority institutions come knocking, uh, uh, historically black universities and you know, any minority serving institution, I think, they, they always ask, what are the motives? What are these, why are these people here? Do they really care about us? Do they just want to uh, be able to recruit students and say, look how many of this we have and how many of that? Uh, do they really care? What's the environment like? How are they going to treat the students? Um, I just find that is so important because I, I seem to talk to more parents now than ever before. Uh, do they want to know, are, there, are you really 
you know, take care of my son and my daughter. And I've had um, parents, um, and these are parents of veterinary students that have, you know, they're either midway their program or entering their program or even at the end of their program. So these these are people that are, you know, 22, 23, 24 years old, and their parents are still looking after them, still wondering about them. I've had parents to, to tell me that, okay, she's coming to Purdue, and she's coming to Purdue because of you. Are you going to take care of her? And that's, that's a tough question, you know, to can you promise that as an administrator or a faculty member? But I can tell you it's different. So you end up spending a lot of time, and it won't always go the way you want it to go. You won't always get the phone calls returned. Uh, people won't follow up the way they should that sometimes we may be used to here. Uh, it takes a lot of uh, effort and uh, hard work to get it done. But I can tell you it is one of the most rewarding things I have ever done, and that's, you know, I feel like we all get to where we are because of, I think, help in life. We don't do it by ourselves. And many times we can never pay those people back to help helped us. So I certainly had, feel like I had a lot of support and help to get where I am. And that's my way of, uh, of giving back to an institution that truly helped me a lot because when I was, uh, I might be going on too long here, but when I was, I grew up in Alabama and I grew up at a time where uh, you know, we were in the midst of desegregation in Alabama. It was a tough time. And, uh, it, you know, veterinary school, there's two veterinary schools in Alabama, Auburn and, 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 and Tuskegee. Auburn has been around 130 years. Uh, Tuskegee started in 1945. And when I applied to veterinary school, to my knowledge, uh, uh, Auburn had never accepted an African American into, into their vet school. So Tuskegee accepted me. Tuskegee trained me, and um, I owe a lot to that institution, and I give back a lot to that institution. And giving back for me is is, is helping uh, those students uh, achieve their dreams of becoming a veterinarian. And then more importantly, uh, our country, our society, we need people from all backgrounds. Uh, we have our countries becoming more diverse uh, in order to serve society. We need um, diverse perspectives. Uh, research has shown that diverse teams outperform teams that are not. So we have to train students from all walks of life, all backgrounds in STEM. And I'll tell you that uh, from my experience, uh, the historically black institutions do a phenomenal job of training, training students in STEM. There's a nurturing, caring he that happens there that just can't happen here at Purdue for a lot of reasons. And they're not negative reasons, it's just di di you know, it's just different, different world, different environment. So with that, maybe I'll just stop and maybe I'll have a few more comments later. Thank you, Dr. Reed. If we could uh, go on with uh, Dr. Morris right next to you. Okay, <clears throat> excuse me, good afternoon. Uh, and it is a pleasure for me to be here to share with you about uh, some of the work that we're doing uh, in collaboration in my office. Uh, the Office of Multicultural Programs is doing in collaboration with our Office of Research Programs here in the college. Uh, I'm Pam Morris, as uh, I was introduced earlier. I'm an assistant dean in the college and the director of our, of our Office of Multicultural Programs in the college. And I came into a little bit of background about me. I am not a product of an 1890 institution or an HBCU in general. However, my oldest son is a product of, uh, of North Carolina A&T. Uh, he graduated from there uh, with a mechanical engineering degree. So that was my first contact with uh, an 1890 institution and slash HBCU. But I have been in my position um, since uh, the um, fall of 2005. 
and I'm also an associate professor in the Department of Youth Development and Agricultural Education. And when I came into this position in 2005, I realized that the charge of this office was uh, first to you know, focus on um, recruitment of underrepresented minorities, undergrad as well as grad students. Well, I really hadn't had any experience in recruitment, so I just kind of fell into the, the, the mode of recruiting the way that we had always been recruiting grad students into our program, and that was, there was a list of, um, of institutions, uh, not necessarily 1890 institutions, but a list of HBCUs where we would visit in the fall and we would participate in, the, in their graduate and career fairs every fall. And so I fell into that, that routine of doing that for a couple of years. And you know, what I found during that time is that it was really challenging. Uh, we were going to some institutions that didn't have programs of agriculture. Um, we were also going to some institutions that were 1890 institutions. So they did have uh, departments and schools of agriculture. And so, but yet still, we were going on a certain day. We were participating with other institutions that were there for that particular event, the career and grad fair, and uh, students would stop by and they would take the promotional items that we had brought and uh, they talked to us a little bit about their interests. You know, we passed out a lot of literature and that was it. And so then we come back and we bring the list and uh, uh, the program manager in my office would, you know, send this uh, list of names out to the different departments and then it was up to the department to kind of, you know, contact these students uh, if you have time to do so. Well, we just were not, you know, I remember one of... Uh, one fall, or, or should I say the summer before that fall, and uh, the dean at the time was Randy Woodson, and he, I went in for a meeting with him, and he said, I don't see any grad students that we've recruited for many of these trips that you've been making, and I thought, you know, you're right about that. You know, we haven't produced one grad student this year. So I thought, you know, there must be another way for, for us to, to be more efficient and effective. And so actually a couple of years ago, I attended um, uh, a conference and uh, ran into one of my colleagues from North Carolina A&T. And uh, we sat and talked and I said, you know, I'm you know, making these trips and, and attending these uh, grad fairs and I'm just not being very productive, you know. So what do you think we can do differently? And so what he shared with me at that time is that, you know, what I think we need to do, Pam, is that we need to have a Purdue Day. Why don't you just come and spend time with us at a and and just spend the entire day. Rather than coming to our grad and career fairs, you know, it just wasn't working. He said, and it really doesn't work because we can't get some students who are really interested in talking with you over to that career fair at that particular time of the day. So he said, you know, have a Purdue day. So I brought the idea back and shared it with my uh, colleague, Sean Duncan, who is the uh, director of our grad program here in the college. And I said, you know, Sean, I said, I think this would be a good structure for us because Sean and I had some discussions. What are we going to do to change change the trend that we had going in our college, and how can we be more efficient and effective in recruiting underrepresented ethnic minorities into our grant program? So we tried it, and we decided that we would uh, target three 1890 institutions. That would be North Carolina A and T. Alcorn State University in Larma, Mississippi, and of course Tuskegee in Alabama. And those were the three institutions that we decided to target. And we thought, okay, we'll, we'll start off with North Carolina A&T, since I had already connected with my colleague there, and it was kind of his idea to have this Purdue Day. And so we kind of talked with him and kind of sketched out, you know, so what will a Purdue Day look like? And so he said, you know, I think first of all, you know, we, we need to meet with the dean. So I said, okay, can you establish a meeting with the dean and department heads in your college or your school of agriculture there at, at A&T? And so he said, yeah, I'll set that up. And we see, he said, you know, also, I think it'd be great if you could go out and meet with students. But not just meet with them, but go to classrooms and talk to groups of students. So we thought, okay, that sounds like a great idea as well. And so we, we uh, pulled the day together and we started off our meeting, uh, meeting with the dean 
as well as the department heads of the different departments there in their, in their School of Agriculture. And so and then he had us going around to all these different classrooms. I think we met with about four or five different classrooms throughout the day. Uh, it was a very busy day, but, but it was very enlightening. And we had an opportunity to talk with students. Uh, they tried to identify classrooms uh, where we could talk with mostly juniors and seniors. However, you know, there were some classrooms with freshmen and sophomore. Why not plant that seed early on? And so that's what we began to do. But we pilot tested this with, with A&T first, and it, seems, it seemed to have been successful. And so the second institution was Alcorn, and so we thought, well, we can do the same thing there. So what we did at Alcorn was something very similar. We met with the dean, we met with the department head uh, of, the, of the Department of Agriculture at, at Alcorn, and we met with a group of faculty. Uh, we were not able to do that at a and that first year that we started this uh, new structure, but we were able to meet with faculty and get faculty engaged in our conversation and get faculty excited about coming here and, and talking possibly with our faculty about partnering on, um, on research projects, on collaborating on grants, and I think together and, and talking as a team about uh, the opportunities of uh, coming here for grad school. Uh, they split us up, and so after the end of the day, Sean and I were exhausted and could barely make it back to the airport. We had talked to so many students. And so what we're also offering is that we've, we've made up this card and um, we tell students, every classroom we go into, we tell them, fill out this card. On the back of the card, we have our information, our contact information. It's like a mini business card for them where they have both of our names and our contact information. And we say, you know, if you fill out this card and, you know, we turn it into our, our grad school that, you know, when you get ready to apply for your for grad school uh, through our college that your your fee your your fee for application will be waived and so now we have that in place but um, really exciting I don't want to take up too much time because we're really you know limited here with time but this has been this we've had an overwhelming response from this new structure for us going out talking with deans, talking with when we were at uh, Alcorn State University, we were even able to meet with the vice provost uh, who is responsible for, for the grad program at Alcorn. And in addition to that, you know, we've talked about, we were meeting with faculty, we're getting them excited. So we also said, you know, we're coming to visit you. We've had tours of their lab facilities, their research labs. This has been great for us, but now, you know, what do we do to make you feel like this is really a partnership? So now we're bringing those institutions oops oh, what happened here we're bringing those institutions here to our campus and we're starting with Alcorn State University and so I hope that while we have them here we have a tentative date of April the 9th through the 11th they're going to be here will there be an opportunity we're going to have a seminar uh, over here in the Dean's Auditorium so there'll be an opportunity for you to come visit you know, talk with, I think there was going to be a contingency of uh, about seven people coming, uh, faculty as well as the department head and the vice provost uh, from Alcorn is coming as well. And so this is an opportunity. We'll be bringing all three groups, but we're going to pilot test this, uh, this visit to, with us, with Alcorn, and they'll be here for a day and a half. So there will be time for them to meet with faculty. Uh, we've, we've uh, I think it was, we were talking about, you know, making sure it's the right fit. And so uh, Sean has identified some areas uh, where faculty would really like a collaboration. And they're identifying faculty uh, who might have, that, have a similar interest. And so I think it's going to be a great opportunity for us to further this relationship and relationship building is extremely important. So, you know, bringing the institutions here so that some faculty and some uh, senior administration can have an opportunity to see what it's like to be at Purdue University, I think will be a, a great benefit for all of us. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Morris. Um, Dr. Knobloch, we'll move on down to you. Sure, this is an, um, an exciting day for me. Um, to be part of this panel and, and to talk about how to how to strengthen the relationships um, with uh, Tulane Grant University structures. I have been working with um, HBCUs uh, for 10 years now 
And I really appreciate all that has been said. There's a lot of wisdom um, in, in the stories and the examples that have been shared. I want to do a quick shout out. Uh, Brittany Brown is a, doctor, a Purdue doctoral fellow. And, uh, and so she's been given the opportunity to, uh, to work on diversity initiatives in our department. I just, I was so proud of her presentation today. Didn't she do a great job? So, good job. So this is a passion of mine, if you can't tell. Um, and trying to, I think it's back to what Dr. Reed said, and how do you give back? I'm a first generation college student, had no intention to get a PhD from a small rural farm in Iowa. And, and here I am today, and so I want to I want to try to return back that honor to those who supported me in my past. My dad has an eighth grade education, one of the smartest men 